Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to episode two of uh, SageMaker Fridays. My name is Julian. I'm a principal developer advocate working on AI and machine learning. And uh, just like last week, I have a co-presenter. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Segolen. I'm a senior data scientist working with AWS uh, Machine Learning Solution Lab. Uh, my role is uh, to help customers get their uh, ML project on the right track uh, in order to create business value as fast as possible. All right. Thank you. It's great to have you again. <laughs> um, so if you missed last week's episode, you can uh, you can watch it on Twitch. It's uh, it's available on demand. Uh, and just like all the upcoming episodes, right, we have uh, four more after this. So um, all episodes are live and uh, we're actually in the Paris office, uh, the both of us. And you can ask questions. So we have moderators waiting for you and they're ML experts and they're super friendly. So if you have questions, please go ahead. Uh, we're just here to help you learn. That's the purpose. And there are no silly questions. Don't be shy. Make sure you learn as much as possible. Okay, let's uh, get started with uh, episode two. So last week mm -hmm. we spoke about uh, predictive maintenance, mm. right? And uh, we trained um, a handmade model on uh, on a data set, right? And we use a convolutional LSTM, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and time series is actually a very, very popular use case for machine learning. And it's a very important use case. You know, mm -hmm. time series data is all around us. So something tells me we're going to continue exploring that today, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so uh, in this second episode, Julian, uh, we are going to talk about uh, demand forecasting, another very popular use case for uh, machine learning. Um, demand forecasting deals with uh, pre predicting customer demand for good or services mm -hmm. uh, in order to optimize their production and supply chain. Okay. You don't want to produce too much, mm, uh, sure. which is wasteful, mm -hmm. or too little, uh, which can cause a disruption. So you want to produce the right amount. Okay, get it just right. Yeah, yeah exactly. of course. I think pretty much every company can can use that kind of knowledge to mm. to be more efficient and uh, and serve their customers better. I, I guess you know manufacturing, uh, yeah, manufacturing yeah. goods, uh, retail, uh, mm -hmm. stocking the right amount of inventory, agriculture maybe you know producing yes. the right amount of uh, of a certain uh, of a certain uh, uh, product. Uh, so you could even if you, if you talk about IT infrastructure, we could probably even predict incoming traffic to uh, to a web platform, right, and scale. <laughs> You're right, Julian. <laughs> And in fact, uh, Amazon EC2 uh, have a, has a predictive uh, auto-scaling feature. Oh, yeah, right. Yes, which I encourage you uh, to look at. But uh, back to our business, um, today our purpose would be to predict uh, electricity consumption for individual consumers. Okay. Uh, starting from a multivariate time series data set uh, built by uh, the University of California. Uh, we are going to train a model based on the state of the art, the SOTA, LSTNet okay. architecture, mm -hmm. um, in order to predict a new data sample and uh, visualize uh, results. Okay. So that sounds super nice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> now, state of the art model sounds a little bit scary and complicated. And uh, every time someone says state of the art <laughs> model, you know, you have to go and read a research paper with lots of math and, and equations, and then you have to try and implement that thing yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so, do we have to do this? No, of course not. Oh. But of course, <laughs> <That's good. laughs> the maths are very scary when you look at uh, some research paper. I agree uh, with that. But uh, in our case, uh, you won't have to understand to do the maths and to nice. code them uh, because uh, Amazon, Amazon Teams have already implemented it uh, in Gluon okay. uh, TS, the package. And um, so Gluon TS is an open source library for time series uh, implemented in top of uh, Apache MXNet. Okay. 
And uh, you will see uh, later, uh, we will simply download the model and use it directly with us. Ah, I like that. <laughs> Doing okay. all the equations. Right. Just yeah. one line of code, get <laughs> exactly, the model. Oh, exactly, yes. one line of code. <laughs> okay, okay. We'll, we'll, uh, hopefully, we'll still talk about the architecture. Of I course. just don't want to get too deep into the <laughs> every single line of code. It's, it gets very crazy really quick. Okay, so I, I like that, that simplicity. And of course, we're going to use SageMaker. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to use uh, some capabilities that we already used last week, uh, training a model uh, and so on, but we're, we're going to also introduce some uh, new capabilities. So for example, we're going to pre-process the data set. Last week, you explained that uh, uh, time series need some uh, uh, pre-processing, sometimes very complex, yeah, a lot. <laughs> And uh, we'll use SageMaker processing, which is a, a capability of SageMaker specialized for um, batch jobs uh, related to machine learning projects, just like pre-processing data. We'll also deploy to real-time endpoint. Last week, I think we used batch prediction. This time, we'll use uh, real-time prediction. And a few more things here and there. Okay, so... Um, this is going to be another pretty intense episode. So um, I'll give you 10 seconds to get some coffee or energy drinks or uh, candy bars, anything you need to uh, bring your blood levels up, uh, your sugar levels up in the blood. Uh, yeah, I need some energy as well. And, uh, and get started. So while you're doing that, um, let me show you. I'm going to share my screen for a second. Um, and, uh, and we can see... Uh, the the repo here, okay. So um, yeah, here it is. So this is the GitHub repo we're going to use, and um, it's an AWS Labs repo, and it's called SageMaker Deep Demand Forecast. Okay, so uh, you can follow along if you want to. You can just clone the repo and then run the notebook, uh, or of course you can go and try that later. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So now that you have coffee and everything you need, let's talk about the machine learning problem. Okay, again, we'll get to the code. Don't worry about the code. But uh, you, you know, you need to understand what the problem is, how we're going to solve it, why this um, state-of-the-art model is a good idea, uh, how does it work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's go back to basics. Um, what is the problem? the business problem we're trying to solve. Uh, so first, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So, uh, oh, I like that. Okay, mine <laughs> are wrong, for sure. This is not <laughs> Yours wrong. are useful. No, no. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, and this, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, this quote is not from me, but from one of the time series uh, father, uh, George Box. And this is exactly what we are going to do today. Uh, when we do uh, demand forecasting, uh, we want to find some useful ones uh, mm -hmm. on top of our, our historical time series data in order to help uh, streamline the supply chain uh, and supply demand uh, decision making process uh, across businesses. Okay. I like I like the, uh, that quote. Uh, yeah, and we actually will see that w when you're trying to predict uh, demand, um, there is no right or wrong answer. Exactly. Yeah, it's uh, in some cases you want to over predict mm -hmm. a little bit mm -hmm. to avoid uh, disruption, mm -hmm. and in some cases you want to under predict mm -hmm. a bit mm -hmm. for other reasons. So we'll we'll give you some examples. So I think that's why um, time series and, and demand forecasting are really interesting because uh, you get a lot of uh, once you've trained the model, you get a lot of options exactly. on okay, how am I going to use this? Mm -hmm. Right? What kind of prediction am I expecting mm -hmm. from this? Okay, so we mentioned it before, you know. Uh, this is a popular problem to solve for yeah. companies, right? So, um, so I'm I'm thinking everybody uh, watching this today can easily find uh, some kind of demand forecasting scenario. Yeah, exactly for their organization. And yes, time series are uh, everywhere. And uh, you know, most of the customers I work with at the ML Solution Labs uh, want to do some forecasts uh, because they really want to minimize risk and avoid uh, uncertainty 
due to the fact that you never know uh, what the future will be. Uh, and uh, we talk about uh, random walk and stochastic mm. process, uh, you, you know, when we model time series and uh, we can have a lot of um, example and application of um, time series forecasting, uh, such as uh, product sales, uh, even cl cloud server usage, sure. mm -hmm. uh, electricity consumption, uh, customer representative, and I can you yes a ton of examples mm. because yeah time series are everywhere so actually uh i remember a couple of years ago i did a a session at uh, reinvent our our technical conference which by the way is uh is happening again at the end of november and it's it's free this year it's all online and free so make sure you join that uh and um and I, I had a customer on stage called advanced microgrid microgrid solutions mm -hmm. And they work in the in the energy sector, and they're actually trying to do at at much larger scale what we're doing today. They're mm -hmm. trying to predict energy consumption. So, um, let me quickly show you. Yeah, I'm not going to play the video. So on my screen, you can see the uh, you can see the uh, the the use case slide from from that talk, and you can easily find the uh, the video on YouTube. Just look for advanced micro resolutions reinvent. And so uh, the use case they were describing is predicting um, supply and demand mm -hmm. uh, for the energy market in uh, in Australia. And of course, you have energy producers, you have energy consumers, and it's it's a spot market. So they need to find uh, to 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 predict the right price uh, every five minutes, right? For that uh, for for energy, and five minutes feels like a lot. Like, you know, predictions are instant, right? Real-time mm -hmm. predictions. Mm -hmm. But in fact, there is a lot of stuff happening during that five-minute time window. Mm -hmm. And they have a, they have implemented a really clever solution. Um, this is a very, very good session. It's, uh, it's probably one of the deepest ML sessions I've done on stage with a customer. Um, thanks to the customers, not thanks to me. <laughs> Uh, they use TensorFlow for this, mm -hmm. uh, and they go they go quite deep on on the architecture they use. They use uh, uh, convolution networks with very specific settings, and they have a custom loss function. I mean, what's not to like? So it's a, it's a really fun session. Again, if if you're uh, if you're into those topics, I, I really really recommend it. Um, so last week we discussed why uh, deep learning was. A good fit for those problems mm -hmm. right instead of traditional techniques so without repeating ourselves too much can you uh, summarize you know why we should use deep learning for this yes yeah, so, uh, in the case of the uh, electric cons electricity consumption um, of course uh, you could uh, predict for each individual uh, is consumption mm -hmm. uh, by using uh, on each time series an univariate uh, ARIMA model, or you could uh, apply some uh, VAR models, some mm -hmm. vector autoregressive model on a group of uh, 10 people. Uh, that can work. Uh, you can okay. do the statistical analysis of maybe one or 10 people. But if you want to forecast uh, for 100, 1000, and or even 1 million of uh, individuals, um, the linear approach uh, gonna be super painful mm -hmm. uh, because first of the computational cost of ARIMA model mm -hmm. uh, because uh, when you do ARIMA model you need to follow uh, the box, box Jenkins procedure uh, for each time series so you need to look at the ACF autocorrelation function PSCF partial autocorrelation function mm -hmm. uh, check the linearity uh, the coefficient the significance of the linear co linear coefficients. Uh, you need to do some strong linear assumption about the residual, uh, and after, um, if you put a VAR model, again a vector autoregressive model, on a bunch of uh, time series, you can have a big problem of overfitting, and you want, of course, to avoid overfitting. So this is the reason why, again, uh, when you want when you have a lot of data and when you want to predict a lot, uh, it's a better idea to uh, go with a deep learning model. Okay, so that's what one. we're going to do today. Yeah. Okay, um, and we're going to use that uh, LSTNet algo, but let's let's get to that in a minute. Uh, let's look at the data set. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me show you on my screen what the data looks like. Are you ready? It's not nice. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it's Jason. You know, as we all know, you cannot kill Jason, and here it is again. <laughs> so, 
the data set that we have is uh, so this it's a it's a slightly processed version of the um, uh, uh, the uh, University of California data set. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have three hundred and forty one. Uh, 321, so 321, 321 time series, time series uh, with a one hour frequency. Exactly. So we've and got 321 individuals that mm -hmm. we are going to study. Okay. And we have about, I think, 12,000 data points. So it's about 2.5 years okay. of data, mm -mm. At one point per individual per hour. So it's a lot, right? Yeah, it's good. It's enough. It's probably, enough. It's enough. Because we have 2.5 years. So we have two full years of, you know, consuming electricity in the summer, in the winter, exactly, the, yeah. full, the full pattern. And right? we, can, we can do the assumption that we are going to have like some seasonal patterns of course. Yeah. Uh, over the year. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's interesting to have at Reasonable. least two years. Yeah. So when it comes to the data set itself, you can see, so we have 321 lines like this one, which is really just a bunch of numbers. It's the power consumption during that hour. And every data point is the next hour. Mm -mm. Okay, so we start at, uh, you know, January 1st, 2012. And then we have pretty much about 12,000 um, successive values for that customer, right? And if I scroll some, some more, we should see, yeah, it's a lot of <laughs> it's a lot of values, right? But trust me, there are other. Oh, here we are. Okay, he's yeah. right. Here's customer number two, and yeah, we have three hundred and twenty-one, just like that. Okay. JSON format. Uh, in JSON format that everybody loves so much. So, um, how much processing do we need here? It looks like it's pretty clean, yeah, right? But again, uh, okay. this kind of data sets. Uh, um, have um, research purpose, uh, purpose uh -huh. um, objectives, so the data here is quite clean. But um, after um, most of the time, uh, data preprocessing, when you deal with uh, real, uh, real world value, uh, the data preprocessing and feature engineering is a super important component of the ML uh, lifecycle. Uh, I don't know if you know the CRISP DM method. Ah, uh, like, yeah, in my nightmares, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yes, the cross-industry... No, seriously, it's important. Cross-industry standard process for data mining, and it is an open standard process model. And yes, data preprocessing and data uh, feature engineering yeah. is crucial, but super. Uh, it can take a lot of time. And we are going today uh, to see how to uh, how SageMaker can help us uh, to do this data preprocessing. Pre-processing job um, with okay. SageMaker. Yeah. So we're not going to we're not going to do much. Uh, let me show you the the script. Uh, this one here. In our case, we are normalized, right? So yeah. So I think the only thing we're doing here is uh, we're normalizing the time series. Okay, because mm -hmm. as you can see, we have some different scales. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe this customer is a uh, you know is consuming tons of electricity. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, consumption right. values are really high, and actually they look quite higher than, yeah, see, than the, the first customer. Mm -mm -mm. So we want to normalize that, and the, the decision that's made here is for each individual time series to find the max value exactly. and then normalize mm -mm. against that between 0 and 1. You want okay. to compare at the same, yeah. same scale, scale. Exactly, to have the same series. scale. Yeah, so it's important. So that's what we're doing here. Uh, there's a little bit of code. Uh, it's it's pretty much the only thing it does, right? Mm -hmm. it, it finds the max value in each time series and normalizes and does that for all time series. Okay. After another very important stuff that you have to do the, uh, most of the time with time series is uh, to look at the missing values, mm. and after sometimes in, in, uh, do some imputation, etc. Oh, okay, but, but I don't think we have missing no, values here. But no, yeah, yeah, you're right. It's it's a good point, right? But it's it's clean and yeah. it doesn't miss anything. Okay, so it's a, it's a really simple cleaning script, mm -hmm. uh, and so the interesting bit is how do we run it, right? Mm -hmm. How do we process data with it? So we mentioned we would be using SageMaker processing, and uh, that's what we're doing. So we'll look at the code uh, uh, in a few minutes after we've talked about the model. But in a nutshell, uh, what SageMaker processing does is it lets you run um, 
batch jobs on fully managed infrastructure. Okay, so we saw last week how SageMaker lets you train, deploy on uh, on managed infrastructure. SageMaker processing follows the same uh, rationale. Just bring your script, just like we're doing here. Okay, write your script, test it on your local machine, and then when it's ready to be run on the full data set, run in production, you just need to um, adapt it a little bit uh, for SageMaker processing. And that pretty much means where's the data set? Where do I write the process data set? Okay, so you just need to be able to get those uh, uh, those paths from environment variables that are set by uh, SageMaker preprocessing, and that's about it. Mm -hmm. So it's super simple. If you have existing cleaning code, you can very very easily adapt it. Okay, and it's super important when you've got some big data, yeah. uh, some big, uh, uh, some a lot of data. Uh, if you can automate your preprocessing sure. stuff, uh, and you can run those, you know, on demand on managed infrastructure, you know, mm -hmm. a thousand times a day if you need to. And yeah. as you will see, it's really one line of code in the notebook so you can run uh, python and um, and of course uh, you, you could install uh, any libraries in there if you wanted to and you can run also on pyspark okay so we're going to use python here but the takeaway here is um, if you have existing code to clean process etc etc the only thing you need to do is add command line arguments to receive uh, the location of the raw data set and the location of the process data set. That's it. It takes, you know, you can literally copy paste those things from one script to the next and you're done. Okay. So th that's really, really cool. Yeah. Okay. Processing is a very, is a very nice thing. Uh, now, as you would expect, this runs inside a container, uh, just like everything in SageMaker. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have, like I said, we have built in containers for. Uh, scikit-learn uh, in Python, of course, and PySpark, or anything, any code, right? And here we use something else. Okay, we use uh, Gluon TS APIs, etc. So we're going to build our own container, right? And that sounds scary. Right? <laughs> yeah, it does sound scary. Okay, well, that's the part that doesn't scare me, but yeah, it does sound scary. It's actually very simple. Okay, so. If you don't know much about Docker, you can learn the basics of Docker in a couple of hours. And uh, the first thing you need to do is write a Docker file, right? And uh, this is a very simple one. We start from an existing Python 3.7 image, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and we just install some dependencies mm -hmm. using pip, right? That file installs pandas. MXNet and Gluon TS, which we use in the script. Mm -hmm. So anyone can write that or copy paste and modify that. It's not going to scare you. Okay. And then we need to build and push the container uh, in, the, in a location that SageMaker can use, right? And that location is an AWS service called Amazon ECR. Okay, mm -hmm. Elastic Container Registry. Uh, you can see it here. I've already done it, right? So it's your private Docker registry with all the good things you like in AWS, security, high availability, etc. right? And it's a good idea to keep your containers close to uh, where you need them anyway. Um, and of course, you do this using uh, standard Docker commands. So just, again, for the sake of completion, let's quickly look at the script. It's included in the repo. You can just run the script in the notebook. Mm -hmm. But come on, we're all engineers here, right? And we want to understand how things work. So uh, first, I need to figure out my AWS account number mm -hmm. because I, I need to have that in the uh, name of uh, the ECR image that I'm going to push. So just a, a CLI call you to STS to get my account number, right? This will be the account number. Then build an image for the container I'm going to create. So account number dot docker dot ecr dot region name dot blah, 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 slash an image name, uh, which I will pass. Uh, this could be anything. And, and then the latest tag, okay? Then I create a repository in ECR. Okay, you just saw it. Okay, mm -hmm. that's this one here, right? Um, if it already exists, obviously, I don't uh, create it. Then I log in to this repository using my AWS credentials. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So by now, okay, I have this repo and I can access it. And then I use the standard Docker commands 
to build a container, tag it with the name I created, and push it to the repo. And this is completely vanilla, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you, you'll see this script in plenty of SageMaker examples. It's always the same. Uh, it's completely generic. So uh, even if you don't want to learn Docker at all, you can just copy paste okay. this, right? That's the good news. <laughs> okay. So that's what we're going to do for our SageMaker processing um, job. Okay. Mm -hmm. Again, if we use scikit-learn or if we used PySpark, we could just ignore this and use the use the existing uh, container and just load or and run our script. Okay, so that's SageMaker processing. It's a really, really cool uh, capability. You can use it for processing. You can use it for model evaluation, mm -hmm. post training, mm -hmm. if you want to uh, to do that. You can use it for plenty of different things and get rid of uh, bespoke infrastructure and tools, right? Okay, so I like SageMaker processing quite a lot. <laughs> Okay, so we talked about data, we talked about processing uh, and processing it with SageMaker processing. Now let's talk about the model, ah. the really cool thing, the really cool bit. Okay, <laughs> so what are we using today? Um, so we are going to use today a uh, um, SOTA model, uh, which is called the LSTNet uh, model. Okay, let me display it yeah. just uh, so that we know what we're talking about. Okay, this is it. LSTNet, yes, yes, yes. So, um, in the LSTNet, uh, what is the cool aspect? Um, so, you can, uh, of course, uh, read the archive paper uh, yes. if you want to know more and to understand. I read it and it's it's not too bad. No, if you skip the math a little yeah, bit, if, no, you, really if, if you assume bad. it's right, which of course it is, because I'm, <laughs> these <laughs> great authors are smarter than I am, but uh, it's actually quite readable, I think. Yeah, yeah, and when you look at this um, schema on the on the screen here, um, LSNX is gonna take the best uh, from the two worlds, from the world of CNN and the world of RNN. So again, kind of uh, mm. similar uh, notions that we used um, last week. But um, the LSNX compared to the vanilla LSTM we saw last week, uh, you've got two new things. Mm. Uh, you're gonna have like some uh, skip layer in this LSTNet plus an auto regressive um, bypass, um, which are added. Um, okay. So yeah. So we, it's if you if you saw last week's episode, yeah, we do see. So we have the time series as inputs, and we have the convolution layers to extract patterns. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then we have the recurrent layers to f uh, find the time element mm -hmm. in the time series. And I think one of the really clever things uh, are those skip connections. Mm -hmm. So skip connections are uh, direct connections between neurons mm -hmm. of different layers. Mm -hmm. And this is a really, I think it's it's widely used for uh, computer vision as well, right? Yeah. I think ResNet has a lot of uh, skip connections. And if I understand it right, the idea is to, uh, because if you have long sequences, yeah, exactly. Yeah, here we're predicting over long sequences, uh, it's difficult for the LSTM to remember mm -hmm. what happened mm -hmm. 24 hours ago, 48 hours ago, etc., etc. Right? And this skip layer is going to be able to capture the very yeah. long term dependency. So it's like a shortcut. It's a shortcut between layers. So if you want to know my electricity consumption, uh, in the next hour, the, the the intuition is look at my electricity consumption yesterday at the same hour yeah, or exactly. maybe the day before, right? Day so day. by skipping mm -mm. twenty four hours into the into the into the future, literally, uh, then we can uh, we can improve mm -hmm. the uh, the model. I think it's a very very cool idea. Yeah. And uh, and what about the auto regressive part? Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, so, in terms of if my 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 uh, first uh, reaction was, but but it's it's typically what we don't want to use, right? Because this is what Arima and the other classical algorithms are used. Yeah, but after uh, this, uh, in reality, what's going to happen is that your output is going to be uh, decomposed between. Uh, the output, uh, non-linear output. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, yeah, from the from the neural network part. Exactly, yeah. and after you're gonna take, you're gonna keep um, an autoregressive part um, when, uh, in order to keep uh, this notion, because sometimes you're gonna do, uh, the the scale uh, ah, is gonna be uh, violet, uh, so uh, you need to keep uh, this kind of autoregressive aspect okay. of the time series. Okay, yeah. So this is a linear model, right? Exactly. This, this is a linear model. Exactly. So if the scale is very different. 
um, it's going to help us figure that out. Exactly. And then we, we kind of sum everything and, and, and I'll put the prediction. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So again, pretty cool paper. Uh, and I encourage you to read it. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's uh, very well written and understandable, even for people like me. All right. So now, um, how about the code, right? This is scary. This is scary to implement. So it's beautiful. Oh yes, <laughs> I'm sure it is. Plenty of color. <laughs> so let's look at the training script. Okay. So you would expect, you know, lots of uh, complicated things here, but what we're really doing in the training script. Okay. So we have a training function that takes a long list of hyperparameters. We'll talk about those. Okay. And uh, Training code is actually just this. Mm -hmm. So build a, a hyperparameter dictionary, grab the LSTNet model from Gluon TS, mm -hmm. passing yeah. those uh, hyperparameters, and then train. So this is completely underwhelming, which which is the way I like it. Right? I think it's uh, it's great. So oh, it's, it's algorithm. Yes, it's yeah. <laughs> so this is it, right? This is the training script, and uh, of course here. Well, the only thing we're doing is in the main function is called the train function and and then save the model uh, once we're Maybe done. Maybe can we zoom a little bit more because I think... Yeah, let me zoom in a bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, and save the model and then evaluate the test set and save some metrics which we will look at. So it's a super simple training script. So for those of you who are... Uh, uh, interested and f uh, want to know more about ILSTNet, of course, if you go to Gluon TS, yeah, if you go to Gluon TS, you'll find the LSTNet implementation, right? And mm. okay, now you can, <laughs> yeah, now you can, uh, hey, that's scary. you need some aspirin here. Okay, <laughs> all right, yes, if you want to see how it's implemented. And uh, if you really need a headache, then read the research paper and look at the code in parallel, right? <laughs> But uh, yeah, kudos to the brave souls who implemented it. Uh, me, I'm very happy to just use the the model zoo and and just call this LSTNet estimator. estimator. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, so let's talk just quickly about the hyperparameters, and then we'll uh, we'll look about we'll look at the um, we'll look at the uh, the SageMaker script. Mm -hmm. So we see plenty of hyperparameters and. We have some uh, some values we're going to use in the notebook. Mm -hmm. How do we pick those things? Uh, so here, of course, the um, two very important uh, hyperparameters in time series is the prediction length and the contest length. So it's like um, the context length is the um, slide, um, sliding windows for the training, mm, okay. and the prediction is the predicting uh, predict prediction okay, length. Okay, so we're using context length data points yeah. to predict prediction length exactly. data points. Okay. Right. And after you've got different other um, hyperparameters, so the autoregressive window, for instance, mm. the number of, ch the number of um, channels, the scaling, if you want to scale the data or not. Um, after you've got the output activation. So in our case, I think um, it's like a sigmoid, mm -hmm. but you can either use non-activation uh, or uh, uh, tangent. Mm -hmm. Yes, and after uh, you can um, choose the number of epochs, uh, the batch size, the learning rate, yeah, the, the, decay, usual yeah, the usual, usual stuff. Yeah. And I think the, the research paper has some uh, some values that they already optimized. Yeah. I think they mentioned using grid search. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so uh, this implementation here will use the hyperparameters from, from the research, research paper. paper. But, after, but uh, you could tweak uh, exactly right? yes. again yeah. and uh, with automatic your model tuning and, and so with your own data. After yes, you need yeah. to change them. And, um, but using the the author, what the authors recommend is yes, uh, probably good is a good idea. I don't know any better. <laughs> Uh, just maybe a, a, a quick word. Um, we see some, um, of course, um, test set evaluation and metrics. Mm -hmm. Can you can you tell us just a little bit about some of the metrics we'll look at on the script? 
So uh, in this script, uh, so you're gonna see uh, we've got like a big table with uh, all the different metrics. But um, in time series, um, what you're gonna um, look at a lot is like the square error. Then after mm. uh, you're gonna have a lot of flavor of the square error. And in this case, uh, we are going to compare uh, the mappy, the symmetric mappy, okay. um, minimum absolute percentage error, uh, which is um, a very common metric uh, widely used uh, by um, our customer and practitioner in time series, uh, because the mappy is something uh, that can be really uh, be easily understood by uh, non paid guys. Okay. And uh, we are going to use the Messi, some quantiles. Um, so yes, different Yeah, we're going flavor. to talk about that. Uh, ah, yes. I think actually the, <laughs> the best part in the notebook is the, the final uh, step where we look at metrics and discuss quantiles. So get more coffee, guys, right? And uh, it's going to get crazy in a minute. Okay. Uh, before we start running the demo, so we mentioned we're going to use a real-time endpoint. Mm -hmm. Uh, just to show you something different, but we could use batch prediction as well, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, just to show you how to deploy an endpoint and uh, and how that works. Very, very simple. Okay, so now it's time for the demo again. Um, this is the repo we're using, right? Uh, in case you didn't catch that earlier. And we have a nice notebook. And let's go through it. Yeah. yeah? Okay. <laughs> so... Of course, we need the SageMaker SDK. Mm -hmm. um, we need uh, the Altair li library for visualization. It's a good one, yeah. It, yeah, it's very nice. And uh, and we need MXNet and Blue on TS and Pandas to do that machine learning thing. Then, of course, import the SDK. Uh, I mentioned last week, if you guys have or are, are already using SageMaker, and, and in case you missed it, there was a, an, a major release during the summer, SDK v2, so make sure you use this, right? There are some changes, but not, not too bad, right? A few breaking things, but re renaming parameters mostly. Okay. Now we're going to grab the data set. The data set. Okay, so it's, uh, it's actually hosted already in S3. So we can grab that data set. It's that JSON file you looked at, right? Oh, you want to see it again? It's so nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so grab that. And of course, we need an S3 bucket for our SageMaker job. And the easiest way is to use the default bucket. But you could use any S3 bucket that you have access to, of course. Okay. So we're going to grab that data in uh, and copy to our S3 bucket. Okay, define some standard locations for the training data, the uh, training output, and a few more things. Okay, so now we're, we're ready to go, right? So the first okay. thing is <laughs> pre-processing. Okay, so let's quickly cover those Docker steps again. Okay, so we're running that script that you saw okay this one let's put all those pieces together okay creating an ecr repo building the image pushing the image okay so that's what happens now okay and we can see docker building the image pushing it right so by now i have my docker image here yeah it's all nice I'm ready to process so now I can just run my processing job okay, mm -hmm. using this container. Uh, it is super simple. So create a script processor object from the SageMaker SDK, passing the, the container name mm -hmm. for the image we just built, and selecting the infrastructure that you want. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here I'm using uh, a simple container with a simple uh, data set so one instance is fine um, but if you use if i wanted to do you know bigger things maybe i would use spice park and mm -hmm. we could do distributed training and the only thing we would say is hey fire me eight instances and you know just say eight and that's it right <laughs> okay and then we just run that uh we just run that code right mm -hmm. using uh, that pre-processing code using the container that we built, passing the location of the raw data and the location of the uh, output data, 
okay? Mm -hmm. Which is, remember those parameters we saw in the script? Um, let me show them again really quick. Right here. Okay, so that's the only thing, that's the interface, right, between SageMaker processing and your code, literally. All right, so now, of course, we're firing up that uh, C4 instance, um, pulling the container to the instance, running the code, right? And a few minutes later, I have my process data. That's great. Right? And it looks like this, which is even more exciting. <laughs> <laughs> more JSON, except this time it's, more it's, even, it's, it's normalized value, right? <laughs> so, yes. Okay. Right. So let's uh, look at that. But at least we know the script worked. Okay. <laughs> and we can download that process data, etc. Okay. So now we have process data. Now it's time to train. Right? So these are the hyperparameters you were mentioning. Mm -hmm. Okay? So uh, context length, 12. So we're using 12, hour, 12 hours worth mm -hmm. of data to predict the next six. Yeah? And then we have some crazy hyperparameters. And um, again, we use the values from the research paper. Okay? And if you want to train longer, you could increase the number of epochs. And if you want to try something else, just go and go and tweak. You know, I, I tweaked a little bit and I found, uh, because I didn't know what I was doing, that there are some relationships between those parameters. So yeah, I think you need to be able to divide the channels by the, the AR window. So it's not just any value, right? So, you know, I, I, I opened the wrong door and... Uh, <laughs> you close it. <laughs> yes. Quickly close it. Just so you know. Just so you know, being very honest with you. Okay, but I, I, I can't help but tweak, yeah? <laughs> okay, and now we're going to use our estimator. So um, we use the MXNet mm -hmm. estimator because we want to have MXNet and, and Blue on pre-installed. We pass the location of the training script, the, the easy one, the one that just pulls the, the, the model from the model zoo mm -hmm. and trains. Yeah? So that's what we're running here. And again, right, you can see the SageMaker part is really the easy bit. Mm -hmm. yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Look at how much time you know, we spend talking about the real problem and the data set and processing it and the LSTNet. W once you have all those parts figured out, yes. writing the notebook is, you know, is easy, right? And, uh, it yeah, should yeah. be, it should be, right? It, and the SDK, the SageMaker SDK should be easy to use, and I really think it is. Uh, this time we train on a GPU instance because deep learning mm -hmm. is accelerated by that. Uh, and we pass the hyperparameters and a couple more things, where to save the model. I mean, nothing fancy. And just like, just like last week, we see the training log. So uh, SageMaker automatically, automatically fires up that P32XL instance, pulls the container, um, copies the data, it's so great, honestly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, you know, just go and have more coffee while this is running. It runs for about 10 or 11 minutes mm -hmm. with, with five epochs. Okay. And so when you're done, well, you have uh, you have your model and you have the, uh, the metrics that we saw, right? So here we see actually lots of different attempts, but uh, I think you would only see one model one output, artifact yeah. and yeah. one output. But yeah, exactly. I keep piling up different attempts in the same uh, prefix. So that's why you see more files. Okay? Yes, a lot. <laughs> All right. But yeah, you would just see uh, a small number. Yeah, exactly. So we grab that output tar file, which contains the metrics. Mm -hmm. Okay? And in case you forgot, these come from the training script, right? Which also evaluates the test set and computes lots of metrics and uh, and saves them to the file. Okay, so now let's look at the metrics because at the end of the day, you know, we want to know if this is uh, a good model or not, if we should train for longer or not. So we extract the metrics, we load them with pandas, and this is what we see. Okay, so we have 321 lines because we have 321 time series. Okay, so each line here in the data frame is or specific time series. And we have lots of metrics. So let's start with the beginning, right, with those, and then we'll talk about the quantile craziness, okay? My favorite part. Okay, Segolen, please help us understand this. <laughs> <laughs> 
thank you. <laughs> I quit. <laughs> <laughs> no, so yeah, all the um, all the, the the metrics here. Um, in a nutshell, what they are going to compare, they are going to compare the predicted versus the actual value um, of your uh, prediction. And after the idea is that you're gonna uh, have some. Um, Uh, some value uh, in, if you have like some uh, scaling problem or something like that you're gonna use uh, different type of metrics mm -hmm. but after for me from um, my in my daily life uh, as a data scientist working with time series at the ml lab it's really the mapping i use a lot so maximum okay. so this one yeah. this one And after I use two uh, the, this notion of quantile loss and okay. uh, quantile function. And again, yes, after the absolute error, it's like you want again you mini you want to minimize the error of your model uh, and comparing the predicting versus the actual mm -hmm. in order just yes, to minimize the risk. Okay, so yeah, if you want to know exactly what those things are, yeah. how, that, how they're computed, you you'll find that on Wikipedia. Yeah, exactly. and on the research paper does a good job at explaining that. But these are basically variants over uh, root mean square error. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. better. Better improved, yeah. Uh, more, uh, yeah, more. Uh, I would say generic versions of exactly. the RMC. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now we have. Well, of course, we have to talk about quantiles. So you want? <laughs> let me show you. Yes. Let me show you w what we're talking about here. Okay. So this is the time series. It's a. It's an ugly one, but it's a time series, and let's say that uh, purple line is what we predict. Okay, so we can see in some cases we're over predicting quite a lot. Yes, mm -mm. so you could say, well, that's a problem because if if we're trying to predict how many pair of shoes we need to stock in the inventory, we're going to stock way, way too many, right? <laughs> And here we're under predicting. So, you know, we're not going to stock enough. So in one case, maybe we're wasting our money building inventory that's not needed. And here we're going to run out mm -hmm. and uh, there will be lots of disappointed customers. Okay, but in some cases, um, you actually want to be either very conservative, mm -hmm. right? Okay. If you want to have too much, mm -hmm. because you don't want to run out, mm -hmm. uh, the business impact of running out will be really terrible. And sometimes you don't want to have too much because maybe you don't have enough resources anyway, mm -hmm. so you want because to under allocate. To Or let's say you're buying, uh, you're stocking uh, perishable food. Mm -hmm. uh, You know, it's probably better to run out than to have to throw away everything exactly. because you didn't sell it, right? Mm -hmm. So there are reasons why you would actually want some safety margin, so to speak. Okay. The problem is if your model predicts one single value, it's very hard to decide, right? It's mm -hmm. like, okay, you should stock 920 pair of shoes. Like, how do you agree on that number, right? So instead of predicting single values, uh, a good solution is to predict intervals. Okay, and these are what quantiles are. So if you knew with, let's say, 80% confidence mm -hmm. that you're going to sell between 200 pair of shoes and 300 pair of shoes, then you can manage the risk. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Exactly. Yeah? If you're a very conservative company, then you know you could say, okay, let's stock a, let's stock a lot, or no, let's understock a bit, mm -hmm. right? But at least you have a range of values, and you can tell your business owners, okay, here, here, here's the trade-off, exactly. instead of giving them a single value. So let's define what a quantile is. So they're called P-something, and that something is uh, the actual quantile. So... The PXX quantile, right, is a value, okay, that tells you what percentage mm -hmm. uh, of your real values will be lower than this. Exactly. So, for example, if you if you ask your algo to generate P95 values, um, then this tells you that 95% of values are lower than this. Exactly. So it's a very conservative exactly. high prediction. Risk adverse. <laughs> Risk adverse. If you have the P5 or P05 quantile, then it means five, only 5% five of values will be lower than this mm -hmm. and 95% will be higher. So if you want to be sure that you never over allocate, then P05 is a good option. 
but the real use is when you combine them right exactly. so if you generate if you ask your algo to generate p5 and p95 then you have a a channel exactly. which is 90 percent of possible outcomes mm -hmm. so you can go to your business stakeholders and say well the, the the decision you should make is pick a value between these the low value and the high value and these are 90 percent of outcomes so depending on how conservative or how risk-taking you are then you can go and and and, and say okay let's use p70 exactly right so we'll predict uh, and base our decisions on p70 okay so that's what the quantile is right i uh, um, hope it makes sense it's a very important uh, concept there's another value that's important it's quantile loss right okay. so explain us quantile <laughs> loss <laughs> no no it's uh, the quantile loss is the average error percentage uh, between uh, the true value and the quantile value okay so that means if this is p95 then i will have a prediction right my predictions will be the p95 quantile mm -hmm. and i also get a sense of how far off the the real value is is uh distant from that quantile value mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so that's another reason because if you have a very conservative quantile but the actual error is huge mm -hmm. Right, then maybe you could take a, a P80 instead, so be a little m l less conservative and, uh, and spend your resources better, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a trade off between you know, how much risk and how much, uh, um, how much risk you want to take and how many resources you have. So, for example, and I will close it at that, uh, if, if, you're, uh, if you're for your model, the P20 quantile is 1.23. Right? Yeah, the true value is lower than 1.23, yeah. 20% of the time. Yeah, so uh, it means your values will be lower 20% of the times. Okay. Uh, if the quantile loss for P20 is 0.123, then it means, on average, of course, mm -hmm. that the true value is 12% plus or minus mm -hmm. a percent away from the quantile. Right, so you know how you know accurate that quantile is. Okay, so you can decide if you want P5, P50, P95. Right, these are not very intuitive uh, no. uh, variables and, and definitions, but they are really important. So read them again, and you'll figure it out. Okay, and this is what we see here. So we see in those statistics, we see quantile loss for P50. Okay, so for this time series, right, the quantile loss, if I use P50 for prediction, the quantile loss is uh, about about 30%. Exactly. Right, so this time series is 30%, the, 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 the real value for this time series is 30% away mm -mm -mm. from uh, P50. And we have, we have all the other ones, right, from P50 to P90. Okay, so looking at those values, you know, you can you can bring options to your business stakeholders and say, hey, um, what's the cost of over allocating? What's the cost of under allocating? Um, so let's find the quantiles, maybe the two, three quantiles that make sense. And then looking at the errors, find the one that is actually reasonably close mm -hmm. to the to the value. Right. So, again, uh, great business decisions. Uh, can happen here okay let's quickly uh visualize a yeah, few things i think we need to wrap up yeah we have a few more minutes just a couple of minutes okay so uh, maybe just this one yeah the the other ones are probably less uh, less interesting so this is just um, a scatter plot yeah a scatter plot yeah between the massy and uh, the symmetric mapping so each yeah each dot is actually a time series exactly yeah, yeah. and you can compare uh, so we see lots of really good ones yeah low errors on both metrics a few outliers so you need to check that we need to check mm -hmm. maybe it's just bad data maybe exactly. it's just weird mm -hmm. uh etc etc okay and there are a few more graphs but uh yeah we can uh, we're gonna repeat ourselves right so we can deploy the model just like that one line of one code. line of code. one line of code there's not much <laughs> to be said deploy and you get a real-time api and uh, we'll talk about that in uh, in more depth in uh, future episodes okay cool all right uh i think we're pretty much done so um let me quickly show you some extra resources that you can use okay
Uh, so uh, you can send your feedback there. Let me display the slide. Uh, take a screenshot. That's the that's the slide you want to keep. So take a screenshot here. So that's the advanced microgrid uh, uh, video. Uh, video. Very cool. Uh, SageMaker, AWS blog, um, the uh, GitHub repos for the SageMaker SDK, SageMaker examples, the repo we use today. There's actually a companion blog post that's yeah, very nice. So well. Gives some extra uh, extra background. Uh, that's the URL for SageMaker Fridays, but you're here today, so I'm, I'm guessing you figured that out. Uh, reInvent and uh, and uh, discount codes for my uh, SageMaker book uh, valid until November 11th, so don't don't wait. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, I'll leave this one just to give you uh, some time to take a screenshot and get the, <laughs> the discount codes. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, I think we're done. So yeah. uh, thank you very very much. Uh, let, let us go back full screen for a second. Okay, here we are. So thank you very much. I hope you learned uh, you learned a lot again today. Ségolène? Yeah, I think that's <laughs> very much. It's my patient time series, so I can talk I can talk about that for hours. Uh, but now, yes, we, uh, we learn how to, to train and deploy uh, SOTA algorithm for forecasting and using uh, SageMaker processing, yeah. uh, which is a very cool capability of SageMaker. And we will see the others uh, interesting in the coming episode. Yeah, so next, next week, week uh, I think, so we're going to say goodbye to LSTMs <laughs> because we, we've gone extremely deep on those uh, deeper than we initially expected but hey i think these are uh, uh you know these are important topics and uh, we wanted to uh, help you understand those um so next week we're going to talk about another popular topic which is fraud detection That's right? right um which uh, matters to uh, pretty much anyone doing online business uh -uh. so pretty uh -uh. much anyone and um, we'll move to uh, different algorithms we'll use xjboost and we'll use random cut forest to train fraud detection models and use more SageMaker features and uh, have more fun, okay, uh, still. And there are plenty more episodes <laughs> to come. So, Segolan, thanks again for, uh, for being with us. Thanks for uh, all the yeah. great insights on time series, LSTMs, and everything else. Thank you to the nice moderators who uh, answered plenty of questions, I hope. And thank you, of course, to all the viewers. It's a pleasure to uh, run this for you. And uh, we hope you learned a lot. And uh, we'll see you next week. And until then, keep rocking with machine learning. Bye-bye. <laughs>